Welcome to this evening's installment of the Silverstein Lecture. And it is a great pleasure to have all of you here and our guest speaker, Cynthia Kenyon. Uh, the Silverstein Lecture Series is presented by the Center for Genetic Medicine and has been made possible by a very generous gift from, the Herman, from Herman and B. Silverstein. And in fact, we have some of the uh, members of that family in the audience tonight. Uh, the purpose of the Silverstein Lecture is twofold. First, it's to recognize the accomplishments and achievements of researchers who have made uh, seminal contributions to uh, genetic uh, uh, approach or to genetics, uh, using genetics to identify uh, uh, important advances that impact medicine. And the second purpose is to allow those individuals to present and help educate the public about what those results are and what they might mean for people who, um, for people in general. So tonight's lecture is Dr. Cynthia Kenyon, uh, who has made uh, really tremendous discoveries in the area of aging. Uh, as she will tell you, aging is not just a random process, there is actually mechanisms and genetic regulation of aging. And this has fundamentally changed how we think about the aging process. Dr. Kenyon uh, began her uh, research career uh, as a graduate student in, uh, at MIT, where she was in the laboratory of Graham Walker, and then did a stint in Mark Potashny's lab at Harvard, before going on as postdoc with Sidney Brenner, where she began her work with C. elegans. Uh, after that work, she went to the University of California, San Francisco, where she has been since. And she has been honored by uh, many different societies and many different universities and uh, been given many awards. I won't detail them, but some of the accomplishments that are the most notable would be that she is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and fitting with the genetic theme of the Silverstein Lectures, she has been a president of the Genetic Society of America. And she is just a terrific lecturer and a terrific person, and it is a great honor to have her here today. And uh, I give you Dr. Kenyon. Thank you, it's really a pleasure to be here. I was actually born in Chicago, so it's, I only lived here until I was three, but it's always very nice to come back and see my roots, imagine my roots anyway. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about a really interesting subject, aging, and it's something that touches everybody. We all feel it, or we will feel it, um, <laughs> and, um, but it also turns out to be a really interesting process, interesting in, why it, in the way it happens. So. It wasn't that long ago when pretty much everybody thought that it just, you just wear out, like a car wears out, a car gets older, and an old car looks old, and then it just stops working. People thought that's probably what happens to humans as well, <clears throat> especially because it is just a process of what looks like deterioration. It doesn't look like it would be something that would be under active control by the genes, for example. But you know, if you think about it, if you look around in nature, you're really, it's really striking how different different lifespans are. So here are three little warm-blooded animals uh, that are about the same size, but they have incredibly different lifespans. And here's another example. A squirrel can live 25 years, but a rat lives three years. So that tells you that, it actually it tells you that the genes have a huge effect on aging and, and the rate of aging and lifespan because these animals are different because of their genes. So it must be somehow that the genes are affecting their, their process of aging in some way. So um, one possibility is that there are actually some, some genes in the DNA that actively control the aging process. Like maybe there's some kind of a mechanism, like a, a dial, and you can turn it up or down. In evolution, it could be turned up or down. If it's turned up in your species, then you age fast, like the mouse, and if it's turned down, you age slow like the bat, for example. That's a possibility. So these in evolution mutations or changes in the DNA of the genes, these genes could have changed the rate of aging. So I was, that's the way I was starting to think about it, about 
uh, I guess around the early 1990s, that maybe there was something that scientists, that was more interesting than just wearing out like an old shoe. So we decided to look for genes that control aging. So if there are genes in the DNA that control aging, then if you change those genes, you should change the rate of aging. You would either speed it up or slow it down. Now, if you speed it up, then the animal would age and die fast, so it could just be a sick animal. But if they age slower, then the animal would live long, and that would be really interesting. So we decided to look for um, changes in the DNA that extended the lifespan. And um, we didn't work on people, of course, obviously. But instead, we decided to work on uh, these little tiny worms called C. elegans. They look exactly like that. <laughs> they're just about the size of a comma, in a sense. They're very, uh, very small, and they live in the soil. They're harmless, but they're really easy to study, um, and they get old really fast. And it's easy to change the genes and track down what happens when you change a gene. So we decided to look for gene changes in these little worms to see if we could find some that would extend lifespan. And we were optimistic because another lab had already reported that you could change a gene and get the worm to live a little longer than normal. So that's what we did. We looked for gene changes that would extend lifespan. So basically, in an, without going into the details, what you basically do are um, the way one goes about studying or looking for genes in these little worms is to just change the genes at random and then sort through the descendants of the animals for ones that live longer than normal. So we set out to do this. Oh, before I um, go into that, I have to take a little aside. We were hoping that something that we learn, we love our worms, but we also would like our worms to tell us something about people. And we were hoping that would be the case. Now at the time, it wasn't clear that there were any genes really for aging anyway. But w there are genes for other things that was already known, like for s making muscles and nerve cells and growing and things like that. And these worms, of course, have this kind of gene. And it turns out that their genes are very much like our genes for basic processes of life. So. I was really uh, optimistic, I was just hoping that number one, we could find genes for aging, and number two, that if we did, they would be acting on aging, not just in worms, but in other animals also. So that was the basic idea. Okay, so we were really lucky, because soon after we started looking for um, long-lived uh, animals, so if you change a gene, then you have an animal that's just like the normal animal, except one gene is different. So you call that a mutant. Okay, so we, uh, and you call the gene change a mutation. Okay, so mutations are gene changes we found that damage a gene whose name is DAF2 um, actually double the lifespan of the worm. So, uh, so in other words, that's amazing because what we did is we had, we had a normal worm, it has 20,000 genes, but one gene was different and as a consequence the whole entire animal lived twice as long. And that's shown here. At the beginning of the experiment, the fraction alive is 100% or one, they're all alive. And then as you, time passes, the normal worms start to die, and by, um, there's a whole population of worms, and by almost a month, there's nobody alive anymore. But here, most of these guys are still alive, and it's not till much longer that they're all dead. But what is really, really amazing about these worms is that they, they actually age more slowly than normal. So, and they look young, they look much younger. It's as if it takes them two days to age as much as a normal worm ages in one day. So, uh, uh, why isn't this playing? This is a little odd. Hmm. Well, I'm gonna get this to play. It cannot beat me. I'm going to look for worm movie, which is down here somewhere, I think. No, it's down here. It's a great movie. It's worth it. <laughs> there it is. Okay. Okay. So this is going to show you these amazing worms. So this is a normal worm, C. elegans. And then right off the bat, you can see why they call it elegans, because it's beautiful. So, and that's what they look like when they're young. And this is what the long-lived mutant looks like when it's young. It looks great. It doesn't look sick, it doesn't look miserable. 
and actually they can, they move around just like normal, and they um, they eat normally, and they can have um, a normal number of, of progeny, normal number of children. So this is the normal worm. Look at here where the head is moving. This is just two weeks later. You can see e immediately that this worm is on its deathbed in the nursing home. And actually, it'll be dead the next day, this guy. So they, isn't that interesting? So in just two weeks, they are old. And you can tell the difference. This one's dead, and this one's, see? Its head is moving, but that's it. Can, it's just on its last legs, even though it doesn't have legs. So, okay, now this is the mutant. Prepare yourself, look. That's the mutant at the same time. So you see, it's not in the nursing home. It's, um, maybe it's a department chair. <laughs> you know, it has that sort of dignified look to it. it <laughs> okay, so that's amazing though, right? We change one gene. And those worms, this worm, he should have been dead, but he's not, or dying, but he's not. He's very, very active and youthful. So um, I have a, a nice analogy for this. So the worm looks much younger than it is. And usually when I talk about this, people think that they think of, you know, being, if I say, you know, it would be like living twice. They think of a 90-year-old person who um, looks really good for 90, but still kind of looks 90. But this is my little analogy. Imagine that you're, say, in your 40s, and you're, um, you're dating. You're single, and you're dating. And you meet someone that you really like, and you go to a restaurant, you're talking, and you, um, you say, well, how old are you? And they say, I'm 80. That's what it's like. So you don't think the worm is, it doesn't look 80, it looks 40. OK, so that's, so it's something that we don't even have we don't even have um, in our mind the imagination for that because we've never thought that would ever be possible. That's the thing that's so amazing about this. So it's great because it's, um, it's completely new and really interesting. So obviously we want to know um, everything we can about what we did to these worms to make them live so long. And I'm going to put this right here. Yes. So, okay, the question is, what does this DAF2 gene do exactly? So I have to tell you about genes. Genes are part of the DNA, but what genes are, they're instructions. And a gene tells the cell to do something. And generally, the gene tells the cell to make a certain protein. Now, what are proteins? Well, proteins are, they can either um, be things like hair or skin. They're the structures of our body for, for a large part. But they also, um, they also make things happen in our body. So for example, when you eat a meal, in order for your meal to be turned into energy, proteins have to attack the food and get energy out of it. So they have all sorts of jobs. So the DAF2 gene gives instructions to make a protein that's also called the DAF2 protein. But now instead of being small letters, which is the gene name, it's a large letters here. OK, so that we have a DAF2 protein. So what is it? Well, as you can see here from the slide, it encodes what's called a hormone receptor. So what is that? Well, you, I know that you know what hormones are. There are small substances that move around in your body, circulate in the body, and when they come into the um, contact with the tissues, they tell the tissues to do something that they wouldn't otherwise do. So for example, the hormone testosterone causes a little XY um, baby to become a boy, to look like a boy and not a girl. So that's an example of what a hormone can do. So how do hormones they're circulating and they're coming into contact with the tissues, but the tissues have to know that the hormone is there. And the way they know is they have these things called hormone receptors. And um, this is what they look like, more or less. So one, this is a cell, which is a building block of a tissue. And one end of the hormone receptor is in the cell, and the other end is outside where the hormones are. And as the hormones come by, they're like a baseball glove and they grab hold of them. And then when the hormone is in the receptor like this, when it's grabbed by the receptor, that makes the receptor active and it sends signals into the cell, <laughs> telling the cell to do something like to become a boy cell, for example, in the case of testosterone. So what is the DAF2 receptor telling the cell to do? Well, we can figure that out from um, just genetic logic. So I already told you that when we take a normal worm and we damage the gene for DAF2, the worm lives longer. So that means that the normal gene makes the worm live shorter, amazing, amazingly. It's actually the grim reaper right in the worm, making it age faster. OK, so all this together says there's a hormone receptor, and obviously also a hormone, that causes the cells to age faster. So this arrow means it promotes this. It makes it go faster. 
Okay, so this is what um, this is what all this means. This was um, the identity. What this, this thing about the hormone receptor was discovered by Gary Rubkin at Harvard, and together our findings, our labs and his, said that hormones control aging. So isn't that interesting? All we had to do is find one gene change that could double the lifespan, which is amazing that, that it was existed, and then find out what the gene did, and then we could figure out that, horm that aging doesn't just happen, that hormones, at least in these little worms, have a big effect on the aging process as unexpectedly they speed up aging. Okay, so it's controlled by hormones. All right, now whenever you, uh, when everybody that's working on these little worms always wants to know if the gene they discover by studying the worm looks like a human gene. Because if it does, it means there's at least a chance that what you've learned in these worms could apply to humans. So, and all you have to do, since we know the DNA sequences of all the genes for the worm and all the genes for people, and every, practically everything in between, not everything, but lots of things in between, um, you can just compare the, what this gene looks like to other genes. And it turns out that the DAF2 hormone receptor is very similar to two hormone receptors that we have in our bodies. It's similar to um, the hormone receptor for insulin, or the hormone insulin, and for another hormone called IGF-1. So you probably all heard of insulin. The normal function of insulin is to cause your tissues to take nutrients up into them and then to either store the nutrients or to burn it for energy. Okay, so that's what insulin normally does, as you all know. IGF-1 is not quite as well known, but that hormone um, promotes growth. So for example, if you're pregnant, you make a lot of IGF-1 and it helps the, the baby grow. Okay, so that's what IGF-1 does. And the DAF2 receptor of the worm looks very, very much like the insulin and IGF-1 receptors for people. So this is um, quite surprising and quite interesting because these hormones, both of these hormones are completely essential. If you um, completely take away either one of these hormones or the receptors for either one of these hormones, in people, they die. Obviously, these get diabetes if you take away insulin, and these have another problem, but they both die. And the same is true of the worm, actually. If you take away the C. elegans, if you take away the receptor, the DAF2 gene completely, if you just delete it, so there's no, actually no receptor at all, then the worms die. So, um, so they're essential. But what we did was we didn't take the gene away completely, we just damaged it. We made it work not as well. So essentially, the cells were still getting um, a signal from the hormone, but it was not as strong a signal. It was a weaker signal. And that was what made them live long. Okay, so this raised the possibility that maybe these um, receptors have another function that nobody ever expected to control aging in humans. And I'm gonna come back to that in a little while. But what I'm gonna do right now is to continue to talk about what these genes are doing in these little worms. So the question is, how can a hormone which is moving around in the body affect aging? How can that happen? What's the link? Well, one very big clue or very important uh, discovery was um, our discovery that of another gene, a second gene, a gene, a fountain of youth gene. So, it turns out that in order for these DAF2 mutants to live so long, they have to have another gene, a gene called FOXO. And for those of you who, are, who know this field and work on C. elegans, who are experts, this gene has another name, which is DAF16. But I'm just going to call it FOXO. It has two names. I'm going to call it FOXO in this talk. Okay, so this gene, which is called FOXO, it's activated um, in the DAF2 mutant, and it extends lifespan. And I'll tell you how we know that. If you see the long-lived DAF2 mutant here in red, if you now take those same long-lived worms and you knock out this other gene, DAF16, or sorry, FOXO, I'm going to call it FOXO, then they live a little bit short. Okay, and in this DAF16 mutant, it doesn't matter whether DAF2 is on or off, they can't live long. Okay, so the presence of this gene, FOXO, is needed to promote longevity. Okay, so we have the Grim Reaper gene and we have the Fountain of Youth gene here. Okay, so how is, what is DAF16 doing or FOXO doing and how is that connected to longevity? So again, it's a gene, so of course the gene is gonna encode a protein and 
uh, in this case, our lab figured out, and also the Rovkin lab figured out what protein this gene makes. And it makes a really interesting kind of protein called a gene regulator protein. And that's a protein that turns genes on and off. So here's, just to show you, uh, first I'll explain this, but first I'll show you a picture. So here's a little s bit of DNA. Now this would just run miles this way and this way. This is just a little tiny piece of it. But you can see the gene regulator protein sitting right on top of the DNA. And these little guys, they find specific spots on the DNA that they recognize and they sit down. And what they do is they um, activate nearby genes or else they turn them off. Okay, so what does that all mean? I have to step back for a second and give you, tell you a little bit more about turning genes on and off. One easy way to think of it is the following. All of your tissues and all the cells in your tissues have exactly the same DNA. So many copies of your DNA in all the tissues. But not all the genes are active in all the tissues. So for example, in your muscles, the genes that you need to move around and write with your pencil and lift weights, the muscle genes are on, so you can make muscles. But the genes that let you see are off. But it's opposite in the eye. In the eye, the genes that let you see are on, so that you make proteins that let you see. But the genes that you need to lift weights are off. Okay, so that's cool. It means that you have this big repertoire of genes in all your cells, but each kind of tissue or cell just extracts the information that it, that it needs to do its job. By, and that is done by gene regulator proteins. So for example, there are gene regulator proteins in the muscles that go to parts of the DNA that, when active, make muscle protein. Okay? All right. So that FOXO is a gene regulator protein. So what does that mean? It means that in order for DAF2 mutants to live long, new genes in the DNA have to become active. And we know that because you need FOXO, and FOXO, its job is to turn genes on. But what are the genes? What are the genes that um, FOXO activates? I mean, what are the kind of analogs to muscle genes, to lifting weight genes for the muscles? What are the living long genes? So we figured this out. Our lab and other labs have been working on it. Um, and it turns out to be a really interesting story. It's not that there's just one kind of biological process that keeps the animal young. It turns out there are lots of different processes in the cell that can make the animal stay young. Um, first, I'll give you a little bit of a description of them, and then I'll give you a nice analogy. So it turns out that when in the DAF2 mutant, the hormone receptor mutant, FOXO springs into action, and it binds the DNA near all these different kinds of genes. And all these different kinds of genes here affect lifespan. So that includes um, genes that make the immune system work better. They're more active, and actually these worms are resistant to infections. Genes that make DNA repair stronger, so these worms are also <laughs> resistant to things that damage DNA. We jump over here. Um, it, it makes more antioxidants, which can um, combat reactive oxygen species. And it also makes this class here, which I call caregiver genes, or caregiver proteins. So it turns out that there are these very altruistic proteins in the cell that help other proteins to, um, to be able to do their jobs, to stay in, in good working order. It's like having a, um, I don't know, a personal butler or something like that, you know? They're like butlers or something, not quite like that. They're like maybe nursemaids. I don't know, it depends on how bad the protein is. But they're proteins that take care of other proteins. And they're, they're really important because they protect proteins, they keep them working well, and also if a protein is damaged, they help it, they, they take it to the garbage can. They help it to, um, to be degraded so that you don't have all these you know, garbage proteins in the animal. So they're really, really important. And they're more active in the long-lived animal, and their activity is needed for the long lifespan. So what you can see here is that, is that when the DAF2 gene is less active, when there's less hormone re receptiveness, when I think there's less hormone than there really is, then FOXO becomes active and it really rolls out a whole battery of protective mechanisms that work together in a cumulative way to increase the lifespan of the worm. Okay, and there's not just one, one way. So the analogy is the following. FOXO would be like a building superintendent. So just imagine this. So suppose that, we're, that instead of you being a body, you're a, you're a house, let's say, or an apartment building or something like that. So if you just take an apartment building 
and you just don't do anything to it. It will deteriorate, and you can see that. But you can take care of it, and it will last much longer. So let's just suppose that there's a building superintendent, and that would be like Foxo. And under normal conditions, the building superintendent's a little lazy. He's there, but he's lazy. And he, uh, so he sort of takes a reasonable job, does a reasonable job keeping things going, but not too good a job. So the building does deteriorate with, after a while. But then, one day, he hears um, that, well, the owner's coming, or there's going to be a hurricane or a tornado. So he thinks, uh-oh, yikes. And he gets on the phone. So that phone call is like the DAF2 mutation. It's like a phone call saying, hey, spring into action. So it does. He does. And what does he do? He calls the painter and the person maybe who um, fixes the roof and maybe the floors, uh, fixes windows. He doesn't just, he doesn't actually do anything himself. He just gets on the phone and calls these people, which is like getting on the DNA and activating genes. But then all these different um, uh, service people with, who do different things come and they work on the building and they're all doing their own thing. But as a consequence, the whole building is much stronger, so it can withstand the hurricane uh, or the inspection from the owner. And it also, just because he's taking care of it, lasts longer. So that's like Foxo. OK, so what does it all mean? Why would, why, what does this mean? Insulin and IGF-1, remember, are essential hormones. What are they doing? Why are they controlling aging? Or what, what does this all mean? And I think one way to think about it that probably is, is the right way, but maybe not, but I think it's probably the right way, um, is that under good conditions, when an, an organism, an animal like with a worm, for example, has a lot of food and a nice environment, um, it's eating food. When you eat food, your insulin levels rise. And so they're on, and it's growing, or its children are growing, so IGF-1 is there. Um, and it's, they're, they're just promoting growth and the storage of food and, and a nice life. But the key to all this, I think, is that if harsh environmental conditions come around, like for example, if there's a nutrient shortage, or if, uh, um, for example, there's a really hot day, or there's a stressful situation that's dangerous to the worm, actually the, the levels of these hormones can fall. And if they fall a bit, what it does is it triggers a danger signal, just like that phone call from the um, guy with saying that there's a tornado coming. And this activates FOXO and triggers cell protection and repair. So basically, what all this work on, on aging from my lab and many other labs has told us is that um, there's a third function for these, recept these hormones like insulin and IGF-1. Under normal conditions, you know, when you eat a lot of food, they're, they're um, uh, helping you to you know, store the food or use it. Um, if you're hungry, they actually, their levels fall, and as a consequence, you are hungry. Sorry, if the food levels fall, the hormone levels fall, and you become hungry. But actually, if they fall a little bit, then your body also becomes more resilient because of this protective response. And that response is probably what allows you to live longer because the same kinds of, um, like I said, the same kinds of uh, mechanisms that would protect you from environmental damage could also protect you from just the wear and tear on your body from ordinary metabolic processes that happen just because you're alive. OK. And it turns out that these long-lived DAF2 mutants, they're resistant to just about anything you can think of. I already told you that they were resistant to pathogens. But they're also resistant to oxidative stress, like Agent Orange, Paraquat, or hydrogen peroxide. They're resistant to it. To high temperature, normal ones will die. These will live. Um, this is a certain kind of stress called ER stress, which is a uh, a stress that part of the cell can, can have, which I won't go into, but they're resistant to that. Hypoxia means not getting enough oxygen. Normally, that will really hurt a worm, but the DAF2 mutants just carry on. So they're amazing. And the reason that they're resistant to all these things is because FOXO is activating these different genes, which is t making proteins that protect them. OK, so there you go. OK. So now we're going to broaden the picture a little bit. What I've told you so far is that signals from the insulin and IGF-1 receptor, which is a nutrient sensor, can control aging by regulating FOXO. Okay, that's all we've said so far. But our lab and, and these other labs 
have now shown that there are a lot of other ways to activate FOXO and extend lifespan. So each one of these little, in red here, the names, each one of these guys is a, uh, is a gene that encodes a protein that, um, if you make more of it, can make the animal live longer. And if you look at what they are, a lot of them are kind of stress-sensing proteins. So this one called HSF1, that's a protein that responds to high temperature. And in response, it's also a, a gene regulator protein. And it, it causes the animal to make um, proteins that protect it from the heat. And that makes it live longer, and you also require FOXO. Now this guy here is an energy sensor. Um, so it's interesting. You have, in your body, you have uh, little tiny, what you could think of them as little tiny batteries called ATP. And the batteries um, run the body, but then they sort of drain and they go dead. And when they're dead, then they turn into something called AMP, which is like a dead battery. And so if you have a lot of AMP in your body, it means that you need more energy. And so this protein, AMP kinase is what it's called, responds to a lot of AMP. And then it, what it does is it um, helps to recharge these batteries, but it also helps to, it also senses that there might be danger. Maybe that's why there's so much AMP, so many dead batteries, something's wrong. So that al it also extends lifespan, and it does through, so through FOXO. And this one here is kind of cut off, but it's called June kinase, and it stresses, it, it senses different kinds of stress, like oxidative stress, like things like hydrogen peroxide or paraquat. And, um, it also extends lifespan through FOXO. And then this one here is a really cool one. This is a, a, a gene called LIN4. And what this, this was, it's not known to be a stress response or a nutrient sensor. It's a different kind of protein. It's a timer. And this protein has been known, or it's actually not a protein. It's an, what they call an RNA. But anyway, it's a gene product. But anyway, it, um, it's, nor, it's used normally during the growth of the animal from the fertilized egg to the adult. And this is really cool. What happens is when the little worm is growing, it, it goes through one stage, and then it enters another stage and another stage. And at each stage, different things happen. It's like stages of childhood in the hu for humans. But this protein here, um, or sorry, this RNA, this little timer, it is needed to advance the animal from one stage to another. If it's broken, then what happens is it goes to one stage, and it's like a kind of a broken record, where it just keeps repeating one stage over and over again, like a record that's skipping and won't go forward. Um, but anyway, it turns out, amazingly enough, that the same um, uh, little guy, Lin4, is active again in the adult to control aging. And so it's almost as though the aging process is a timed process, because because this, that's what this little guy is. It's a timer. So the fact that it's on again in the adult, which isn't, it's already adult. It's not growing anymore. But nevertheless, it uses this, uh, this little guy here to determine how fast to age. And the way it does it is by regulating or changing the activity of FOXO. OK. So and then we have another one here. It's a germline sensor. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But from this slide, what you can see is, is really very interesting. Not only does FOXO, I told you, FOXO does a lot of different things. So there's a lot of arrows coming off of FOXO. It has a lot of different jobs to do. But there's also a lot of arrows coming into FOXO. Here. One here and here and here and here. So there's lots of different ways to activate it. And I think you know, if this does turn out to be a human lifespan protein, and we'll get to that, it may be that there would be many different ways, possible ways of activating the protein. So for example, it's possible, in principle, that you could activate it and stay young longer by changing insulin signaling. But it's also possible that that would have a side effect. And any of these could have a side effect. But if this one does, maybe this one won't, or this one. So it gives you a lot of potential options for intervening if, if humans are like these worms. And it's also just plain interesting that there's so many different ways to, um, to activate this protein and live, and live long. So I want to mention that there's not, this is not the only gene regulator protein that, that uh, affects lifespan. There are others, too. But we just don't have enough time to talk about them. But this, I think, is probably the most important one that's been, is thought now to be at least a very central one. OK, so now this slide takes every, the picture, makes the picture one a little even bigger. So what this slide 
has is the same stuff I showed you before, but now it's telling you what kinds of environmental conditions or um, internal conditions in the animal can trigger the activities of this life extending process. So you might think, why would the worm have a life extending you know, process? What, what, is there something that can actually trigger it? And it turns out that there is. And so the first thing, so I'm going to tell you about three things from this slide. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is called caloric restriction. How many of you have heard of caloric restriction? Yes. Okay, good. So it's pretty famous now, and it's really interesting. It's a phenomenon in which, just like the name suggests, you eat less than you would like to eat. And in lots of animals, from yeast to worms to flies to rats and mice, um, it extends lifespan. It was actually discovered in the Great Depression in the 1930s. People were hungry. There were a lot of people that were really hungry. And so scientists decided to see what the effects of prolonged hunger would, hunger would be on health and lifespan. So they, they didn't study this in people. They used rats. But they took rats, and they fed them about 40% less than they would normally eat. So they were pretty hungry rats. And of course, they expected to have all sorts of problems. But they didn't, actually. Instead, they were very long-lived. They lived maybe 50% longer than normal. That would be like for, instead of having an 80-year lifespan, you would have a 120-year lifespan. So it's a big difference, even though it was just a rat only has a three-year lifespan. So in years, it's not that big. But in percent, it's very big. And not only that, they didn't get the normal diseases of aging. So they didn't get cancer. They didn't get um, uh, heart problems, all sorts of things that can happen when they're old didn't happen to these calorically restricted animals. And that turns out to be very consistent across, um, across species. So why are these animals living longer? One possibility would be um, kind of a passive idea. If you're not eating as much, then your body doesn't have to work as hard to digest the food and to use it because there isn't as much of it. So you could just imagine that if it's not working so hard, it just doesn't wear out as fast. That's a kind of passive model. But it turns out that that is not true. It turns out that having, uh, eating less food extends lifespan. It doesn't just automatically extend lifespan. You need certain genes to do it. And some of these genes are affecting FOXO. So there's, and what's, okay, so people would think, first they thought it's just going to be a kind of passive consequence of not eating so much. And then they thought, okay, there's, maybe there's a mechanism. What is the mechanism? But it turns out there's not just one mechanism. There are at least three different ways that um, caloric restriction can extend lifespan in animals. And it depends on how you go about calorically restricting yourself. So one way you can do it is to eat every other day. That extends lifespan of, of mice and rats and of worms too. And it turns out the mechanism of that is known. And it turns out that that mechanism requires FOXO. You get a little lifespan extension without it, but not nearly as much. And it also, the experiment suggests that it's acting through the insulin IGF-1 receptor. So what's happening is you're changing the insulin hormones in the animal. OK. Another, thing that, another way that you can try this is you, I mean, if you're a worm, is you could grow to your middle age, and then you could start, you could start then. You might think, uh-oh, maybe I'm getting older. Maybe now I better start. So if you do that, the worms live longer, but now it's a different way. They live longer a different way. What happens is that the, this energy sensor, the AMP kinase, becomes more active. And that AMP kinase actually um, physically associates, touches the FOXO protein and makes it active. And then FOXO extends lifespan. So we have one way here for FOXO to be active uh, if you do if you calorically restrict yourself starting when you're middle age, and another way if you just do every other day feeding. And there's a third way, and I'm going to get to that in another slide. The reason it's on another slide is the third way doesn't even involve FOXO at all. Okay, so that's pretty cool. One thing that's pretty cool is that the mechanism by which caloric restriction extends lifespan is being figured out. You know, now we have some genes for it. And the second thing is that there's not just one way, but there are many different ways. Okay. Now, it turns out you can do more than one of these things at the same time. And that's what that next slide is going to show you. So what we did is we took DAF2 mutants, which live twice as long. Oh, I forgot to tell you this story. I'm sorry. This is my favorite. Sorry. OK, this is the empty gonad. Now, yeah, it's a, it's a good story. OK, so 
so all animals have a reproductive system, and there's two parts to the reproductive system. There are the sperm and the germ cells, which are the sperms and the oocytes. And those are, you know, that's the next generation. When the sperm fertilizes the oocyte, it turns into a person or a rat or whatever it is. Um, but there's also other reproductive tissues that in the animals surround the germ cells. That would be like the uterus or the spermatheca or the ovaries. Those are the reproductive tissues. They're not actually going to turn into the next generation of, in, of animals, but they're needed to shelter the germ cells and nourish them. Okay, so that together makes up the gonad. And it turns out we discovered in these little worms that, um, that if you um, remove the germ cells, so you, you leave, well, first of all, we discovered, we first, th let me start over just a little bit. There are a lot of um, evolutionary biologists who thought and postulated that there was a trade-off between reproduction, having children, and living long. So the idea was if you had a lot of children, then your resources, the food that you eat, would go into producing these children, and you couldn't use them for living long. So if you had fewer children, you would live longer. And um, so we tested this idea. And the way we tested it was we took a laser, a tiny little laser, and we killed the cells that give rise to the reproductive system. There's four of those cells, and you can just shoot them out, bum, 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 bum. And then the worm grows up with no reproductive system at all. This is what the reproductive system of the worm looks like. So you can imagine a worm's body here, which is not drawn, looking like this. But this is the reproductive system. So normally, it, it's there, but it's not there if you kill those cells. But what we found is that, they, um, that those worms with no gonad had an exactly normal lifespan. So at least in these little worms, just not having progeny, all the energy or whatever, the resources that it saved by not making these children, which is 300 children for these worms, they have a lot, big families, um, they, um, they didn't just naturally use all that to live longer. They had this, a normal lifespan. But then what we found was really, really cool, was that if we just killed the two cells that give rise to the sperms and the oocytes, the germ cells, but we left the surrounding tissues. So now we have an empty gonad or an empty reproductive system because it doesn't have any germ cells in it. Now the animals live long. They lived about 60% longer than normal. So the empty gonad could extend lifespan. So here the, it's really interesting because the germ cells are doing two incredibly important things. One is they are the next generation, which is incredibly important for the life of a species, but they're also kind of at the helm controlling the aging of the body in which they reside. So we don't really know why this is, but we have a favorite idea, which is that maybe the animal is slowing down its aging because it's waiting for the germ cells. Maybe it thinks the germ cells aren't enough of them or they're not ready, so it's waiting until they're ready before it ages so that it can still reproduce when it's in its prime. So in other words, it could be that this is a timing mechanism that coordinates the rate of aging with um, reproduction. And it's, it certainly has a huge effect on the worm. And it turns out that this, a similar, uh, oh yeah, and I, I should tell you this, that in order for these guys to live long, they need FOXO. And they also need this other protein here, which I won't talk about. But anyway, um, but it turns out if you do the same thing in, in the fruit fly Drosophila, if you remove the germ cells, so you have an empty gonad in, the, in Drosophila, then the fly lives long. And FOXO, FOXO is in the fly too, and it's more active. So this could be a mechanism that's um, not just a worm thing, but that's in more organisms. And even in mammals, if you take a mouse, and a young female mouse, and you take her ovaries out, and you put them in an old female, the old female will live longer, which is amazing. And no one knows how it, how it works. But there are signals from the reproductive system that are affecting the, um, the lifespan of the, of the mouse, of a mammal. OK, so that's the little story about the gonad. So that's a signal from something inside the body instead of as opposed to um, food. Well, food goes inside the body, so I guess it's not that different. But this is, a, um, this is an organ. And there's one more way that you can get worms to live long by fooling around with the environment. And that is um, by changing their perception of sensory cues. So these little worms they don't, may not look very smart to you, but they actually can discriminate and distinguish many different odors and many different tastes. And there are all sorts of things that they like, and there are things that they don't like, like garlic. They don't like garlic. <laughs> but it turns out that, that the sensory neurons that they use, the taste and smell neurons, which allow them to sense these things, 
also control their lifespan. So we, did, we, we discovered this. There are mutants in the worm that can't smell very well or taste very well. And they live long. They live like 60% longer. So it's, it's quite, quite amazing. And their ability to live long seems to depend on uh, the activity of this insulin receptor and FOXO. That's why I drew it up there. So, so that's really neat, because now the brain is controlling the, um, the lifespan of the animal. So what does that mean? Um, first of all, it turns out that there are specific neurons that the worm has. Some, some of them normally make the worm have the ability to extend lifespan. Some have the ability to shorten lifespan. So there's different kinds of neurons. It's very complex. And they seem to be responding to a variety of different cues in the environment. We don't know the details. But what I think is happening, maybe, is it's possible that the worm is sort of monitoring the quality of the environment by smelling and tasting things. And, and when we change the neurons so they don't work very well, it's probably the case that the worm, it's, the worm may think, or not think, but experience a sensation of being in a dangerous environment, you know, like an environment where food is running out or things are changing in a bad way. So again, you can imagine that they're having this stress response, which is activating FOXO and extending lifespan. And the thing about it, I think is interesting is that it probably gives the worm a faster way to react to conditions in its environment. So for example, it doesn't have to wait until it's hungry to um, activate FOXO, but instead it can just sense a change in maybe food levels that it can smell. Actually, this is interesting. If you take a fruit fly and you calorically restrict it, you don't let it eat enough, it lives long. But while it's not eating enough, if you let it smell food, then it doesn't live as long. So the food and the sense of smell can also affect the lifespan of the fly. And it means if you want to calorically restrict yourself, you can't go even to the table. <laughs> I don't know really if it means that, but however, it's true that in, in people, when you, eat a, when you eat a meal, your insulin levels rise, but if you smell the food that you eat, the level of insulin rises even more. So we are, since we have um, basically sensors for, for food that affect insulin in our brain. Okay. All right, so there are three kinds of things I've told you about. There's caloric restriction, activating FOXO, sense of smell or taste, and the empty gonad. So a whole variety of inputs. OK, so then what I was going to tell you, right, was that if we do two things at once, what happens? Well, we tried this one experiment, which gave a great result. Well, we took a DAF2 mutant, which lives twice as long, and we also um, removed its germ cells. And then what we found, um, we found that it lived six times as long as normal. So instead of living like 20 days or so in this experiment. The average was 126 days. And amazingly enough, these worms were really, um, they were very, very active. So this movie here shows you uh, two worms. This movie was filmed when the worms were 144 days old. Now, that n the average lifespan was 126. So by this time, a lot of worms had died. But these guys were alive. And they were young. They looked young. Look at that. Remember that movie I showed you, you know, the old worms? These guys look really good. And in fact, when um, the graduate student did this experiment, he took the worms around the lab and showed other people. And he just did a little experiment. He said, how old do you think they are? And they said, well, probably about five days old. But they were 144 days old. So that is quite amazing, because it says that these worms have the kind of latent capacity to live way longer. In fact, another lab now has gotten them to live 10 times as long as normal. So, um, so the potential of all this is just, I, I don't know, it's really very potentially dramatic in, in these little worms. But then I have to stay, take a step back, though, and say, um, if you compare that tenfold lifespan extension or sixfold to what evolution has done, it really pales in comparison. So if you imagine that in evolutionary history, our most distant ancestors had very short lifespans, which is probably true, like maybe a couple of weeks. And that changes in our genes as we evolved, extended our lifespan, which must have been the case, then um, to go from a worm-like lifespan to a human lifespan of, let's say, 100 years would be 2,000-fold. And this happened. I mean, it must have happened during evolution. So there is a, um, a huge potential that was already expressed for, um, for increasing lifespan. And also, there are long and short-lived birds 
and they're long and short-lived mammals and long and short-lived insects. So there must have been a first bird and a first mammal and a first in in insect, which means that the ability to live long probably arose more than once in evolution. So it's very interesting to think about. Okay, how are we doing here? All right. Uh oh. All right. First of all, I don't know why we have a recovered file here. We don't really need that. I don't want you to say that. Let's just go to our. Okay. Okay. Oh, come on. Okay, so I'm just going to mention here that there are some signals that extend lifespan without activating FOXO. Um, one is low temperature in the worm. Another one is fooling around with energy production in a different way, which I won't talk about. But this little skinny worm, I will talk about. This is a guy who's been calorically restricted his whole life. So it's not like it was every other day feeding or starting at middle age. It was the whole life. And this guy lives long without FOXO. So there's a whole third mechanism for the animal to live long. And this is actually quite interesting because the reason he, this little guy lives long is because uh, another nutrient sensor called TOR is less active. Now, there is a drug that, can, um, that you can take that inactivates TOR, that turns its activity down. And if you give mice that drug, even when they're middle-aged, they live longer. So we, tor, th this drug called rapamycin is something that people take to prevent, after they have an organ transplant, it suppresses the immune system. So they take it to prevent um, the rejection of the graft, like a liver transplant or something like that. Um, and it's also used as an anti-cancer drug, too. But it may have some side effects. It's not clear that you should go out and take rapamycin. But I just think it's really remarkable that right now, today, there is a drug that you can give to these middle-aged mice. Actually, they'll be the equivalent of 60 years old, so they're really getting on just a little bit. Um, and uh, they live longer. So what about people? This was one of the big, or not just people, but higher organisms. This is a big question. Um, and the, answer is, the answers are coming along, and they're very interesting. So several years after we discovered this DAF2 pathway in the worm, people made the same changes in the fly, and they showed that the flies lived longer. And then along came lots of different changes in the mouse in either the insulin genes or the IGF-1 genes, or genes that controlled them, or genes that were controlled by them. And the mice all live longer, or lots of these mice live longer. So that means that this um, insulin system, and at least for these two guys, FOXO, we don't know yet for the mouse, um, regulate lifespan in lots of animals. And what about people? Well, so you can't just you know, make mutant people for lots of reasons, ethically, and also it would take a really long time. So, um, but you can study people who live long. So there are people who live to be 100. And one possibility is that they have different forms of, the, um, of these genes. And it turns out that people who live to be 100 are called centenarians. And it turns out that uh, there's this one study that was done in a group of people um, that found that centenarians were more likely to carry mutations that reduce the activity of the IGF-1 receptor. That's a human DAF2 gene than are those who die earlier. So a lot of centenarians, people who live to be 100, have a DAF2 gene that doesn't work quite as well. It's a little bit damaged. And they showed, actually, molecularly, that this gene doesn't make as good a receptor. But I mean, I don't know if it's not as good. It doesn't work as, it's not as active. But the consequence is that, at least, I don't know if that may not be the only reason that they live to be 100, but they were more likely to be present in those people, suggesting that they might be um, potentiating this growth to, to uh, advanced age. And then, uh, oh, this is a picture, just to show you. Centenarians can, s often they look really old, but sometimes they don't. So this man was photographed at age 100. And this is his son, who is 70. So isn't that amazing? So these people are actually aging much more slowly than normal people. And FOXO is so far the winner. So there are different forms of the FOXO gene. So let me just tell you what that means. Let's suppose you have a uh, one gene for eye color, just to make an example. So you would all have that gene. But some of you would have the blue-eyed version and some the brown-eyed version. Okay, that's what I'm saying. So there are different forms of the FOXO gene. And there's actually what seems to be a long-lived form and a shorter-lived form. And there's a certain form of it that's much more 
likely to be uh, present in people who live to be 100. Um, and the other form is, it's not that much more likely to be present, but it is statistically significantly enriched in people who live to be 100. And this has been shown in populations all over the world here. There's actually three populations in Europe. Uh, there's an Ashkenazi Jewish population, people from California were studied, New England, people from Japan and China. And in every study, people who live to be 100 or into their 90s were more likely to have this certain form, let's say the brown-eyed form of the gene. I don't mean to say it's eye, eye color, that's just a total analogy, but um, a certain form of the gene. And we don't actually know how, why, what's different about FOXO um, in these in, in, the, in this form of the gene. Does it work better? It probably w is more active, but we don't actually know that yet. But the cool thing is that this really strongly suggests, it doesn't prove, but it strongly suggests that both the um, DAF2 insulin IGF-1 receptors and FOXO can affect lifespan in people. So we're susceptible to the effects of it, which means maybe we could make, eventually make, have a pill that we could take that would make us stay young longer. And it's not just staying young longer, actually. It turns out that one of the most amazing things about these mutants, which I haven't talked about yet, is that they are resistant to a wide variety of age-related diseases. They're resistant to cancer, to um, protein aggregation disease like Alzheimer's and Huntington's disease. This is the animals. Um, to uh, cardiac problems, to heart problems. They don't get atherosclerosis or heart damage. It's, it's really amazing. Maybe it's partly because they're um, they're young, when they should be old, they're young, so they're not r susceptible to the diseases of old age until they're old. And even when they're old, they seem to have more weaker forms of these diseases. So it's possible that one could, by targeting one of these life-extending pathways, one could actually have a way of not only staying young longer, but going after lots of diseases all at once. So it's a very exciting um, therapeutic opportunity, I think. And in fact, my lab now, is very excited about this. And so we're looking for small molecules that can activate FOXO in human cells and culture as a way of trying to um, you know, take steps in the direction of making a drug that could delay age-related disease and keep, keep us young. OK, this is just a little thing about TOR and rapamycin, which I already told you about. So maybe there'll be someday a drug. I know that we're out of time, so I'm just going to take one or two minutes and talk about sugar, eating sugar. So sugar, glucose, stimulates insulin. And so if low insulin makes you live longer, does high insulin make you live shorter? So we asked that question. And we gave our worms a little sugar, not very much, 2%. A candy bar is 75%, not very much. And it shortened their lifespan. And other labs found that too. And sure enough, we found, I won't go into it because I'm out of time, that glucose probably shortens lifespan by making FOXO less active, the opposite of what the long-lived mutant does. It makes it more. We're turning it down. And if you actually, if you have a worm and you take away FOXO, it lives a little bit short. And that's what happens if you give it glucose. OK, so I'm going to, so the question would be, could eating less sugar, like a low glycemic diet, like the South Beach diet, for example, could it actually lengthen lifespan in people? This just says that there are lots of diseases that are affected by this. Here's a worm tumor. I'm not going to go into it. And here's a list of the people who, uh, some of the people who pioneered different studies from my lab that I talked to you about. And um, so I'll stop now, and um, I'll take questions if you have questions. And thank you very much. So Dr. Kenyon will take questions in one moment. There's just a few things I have to say first. Um, First thing, and in retrospect, our menu may not have been the best choice. There are uh, cookies and <laughs> other uh, sweet foodstuffs available for a reception. And Dr. Kenyon will not only answer questions now for the entire auditorium, uh, but she'll be available to talk with during the reception. Um, the second thing I want to say is that there are a number of people we have to thank. Uh, so first, again, in, uh, we'd like to thank Dr. Kenyon. Uh, we'd like to thank uh, the Silversteins for providing the funding for this. And I'd like to thank a number of people associated with the Center for Genetic Medicine who have made this possible, starting with uh, the interim director, Dr. Peter Kopp, and then some of the uh, program assistants who made this happen, uh, Nell Wasserstrom and Megan Boyle. And lastly, the
questions you ask, I'm going to ask that people use the microphones that will hopefully be brought around by the members of the staff. And uh, because we are taping this lecture, we actually have all the Silverstein lectures available on the website for the Center for Genetic Medicine and now on YouTube, so that uh, if you ask the question with the mic, we will be able to hear the question and the answer when people uh, look at this in the future. And finally, one last finally, I'd like to thank all of you for coming to the lecture tonight and uh, participating and uh, making this a, a wonderful event. So Dr. Kenyon will now answer questions. Yes, okay, are there questions? So I guess you need a microphone, right? We have to wait for a microphone. Okay, here comes a microphone. A long, long time ago, I don't know, is this working? Yes. Okay. It is working. A long time ago, I took a seminar course on aging. And I remember uh, reporting about a study on rotifers that you may know uh, reproduced by parthenogenesis. And if I remember right, what the study showed was that the eggs from young rotifer mothers gave rise to offspring that lived a long time. And eggs taken from older rotifer mothers, uh, the lifespan was younger, uh, was uh, shorter. So there was something in the egg that That's either the young eggs, it was either mm -hmm. promoting mm -hmm. life or something in the old eggs that was shortening it, but it was in the eggs. That's interesting, I didn't know that. But the yeast cells, when they divide, there's a, a, what they call a mother cell, which keeps making little baby cells. For about 30 times it does that, and then it stops. The yeast, the, the young mothers produce um, little yeast cells that divide more times than the old mothers. So, and people think perhaps there's some damage that's built up in the older um, organism that's being passed along, that there's, maybe it's more effectively removed, or it's just not as much damage in a young mother. That's the, um, that's the idea. Now, I don't. Not that I know of, actually. Not that I know of. Yes, there are problems that can happen with chromosomes, with the DNA itself. Like you can get more Down syndrome incidence goes up, and that's because you get three copies of one of the chromosomes instead of two. So it's not quite the same as as aging itself. It's different, but yeah, but it. But probably it is because things are starting to break down a little bit. Um, I'll have to wait till a microphone appears. In the past, we used to think that the genetics were much more important than environment. But your lecture indicates that, actually there is a new book published, Virus of the Mind, it indicates that really genes are not as important as we used to think but environment and lifestyle are much more important than what our parents gave us. Well, that's a very interesting, that's a very interesting thing to say. Um, and I, I think you're right. There are environmental influences that are important. But there's also two things that it makes me think of about genes, three things. The first one is that all people live a lot longer than all dogs. Okay, so we all have human genes and they let us live longer than dog genes let the dog live or horse genes let the horse gene. So we don't see the differences between us so much, but there we see them when we start looking at different species. So our genes are all letting us live a lot longer than we would be living if we had dog's genes. That's number one. Number two, um, uh, let's see, there are certain families where um, many, many family members live to be 100. It's amazing. So there are people who live to be 100 who have no relatives that do, where they're just different. They just l live a really long time. But there are these families where just by sheer chance, it would never happen by sheer chance. It's like 10 to the minus 11th probability or something like that. So these families are kind of like DAF2 mutant families. I mean, the DAF2 mutant passes on its longevity to its children. That's what they're, and so people are trying to find out what's in those families. What, is, what are the forms of the genes 
that are contributing, that are um, being inherited, that are allowing them to live longer. So between those, those families and ordinary families, there's a big difference. But you're right, just in the general population, I, I think that between differences between individuals, I think you're right, things like lifestyle do play an important role. But I think usually the family members follow the same pattern of lifestyle and environment that they're, they used to live with their parents or whoever. I don't know, yeah. you know, people have been asking <laughs> these centenarians what they do, and they smoke, you know, <laughs> they, they eat really badly, they do all the wrong things, and yet that's the story that you hear. So I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but it's not, just, it's not just that they have a special way of living, because it's not just that. Yeah. But the lifestyle like, is important too, I agree with you there. Oh, oh, I forgot to say the third thing. These little worms they are very interesting. They reproduce by self-fertilization, they're hermaphrodites, which means that they're completely inbred, so much that every single worm in a population has exactly the same genes. So there's no difference in the genes. And they all live in the same place, but they don't all age at the same rate. I showed you those curves, right, the lifespan curves. So some worms are actually getting old and dying here, and others wait until they're out here to get old. And they're actually aging at different rates. When they're starting to look like they're in the nursing home, uh, um, other worms might be looking a little bit younger. And those worms that look younger, that are moving, actually, they slow down and die later, whereas these ones die. And in fact, even in people, a, a biggest predictor, if you're in your 60s or 70s, of lifespan is how well you move. That's, of all the predictors, it's the best one. So, but what's interesting about these worms is it's not genes and it's not environment. So, I mean, they're all worms, so they're all going to, nobody's going to live to be a, a hundred years old or anything like that, but between them, you can't explain it by genetic differences or, or by environment. So it's probably chance. There's some chance factor, something maybe happening early in the life that has a lasting effect on the worm, and no one knows what it is. We're, lying, we're trying to figure it out, and other labs are too. So it's, it's a very, very interesting thing, the role of chance. No one really thought that that would play much of a role. It does in mice too, because inbred strains of mice the mice don't all die at the same time, even if they live in the same environment. Okay, that's a big long answer to your very interesting question. Okay. I have the microphone, so I'll speak next. Um, drawing on your point number two from uh, your last answer, uh, it, it, it seems that despite everything that we're doing, uh, we're much lazier now than we were 40 years ago. We eat a lot more sugar uh, than we did 40 years ago, uh, we eat a lot more carbs. Um, we're doing a lot of things wrong. We're much more sedentary. And yet, heart disease has plummeted. And it's not just because people are taking statin drugs. I mean, uh, you know, just, I, it, it's hard to say, uh, why is this happening if it's not environmental? Oh, or if it, I'm not or, saying, or I'm is not all saying of a sudden the FOXO being more oh, no, expressed. that's not because we're changing genes in the last 40 years, that's for sure. There's no right, gene changes. It, you know, no, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think there are health, you know, there's better hygiene, antibiotics, things like that. Um, I don't know. There could be a sense of, of uh, stress. They did a study in England, um, and they found that the biggest predictor of your lifespan was to what extent you felt that you were in control of your life. People who were who felt, you know, they were un in bad circumstances, maybe they were being treated badly by their boss or something like that. They didn't have any control, there's nothing they could do about it. They are people, by the way, who also are taking care of um, terminally ill other people, children or something like that. That is a kind of stress where you don't feel like you have control of your life, and that was a big predictor of, uh, of mortality. So maybe we have had a sense of freedom and that maybe that's had something to do with it. The usual story is that it's medicine. It's medicine, you know, and I think 30 years ago, people did have much better, when I was a child, I don't know, we ate, well, I won't go into what we ate, but I think it was a healthier, <laughs> I think it was healthier than what people eat now, and actually they're saying now that we might have problems in the future with a lot of young diabetes from, that's starting at an earlier age, but it's a complicated question, and I don't know all the answers by any means, yeah. You, you mentioned the lifespans of you know, the highly varying lifespans of, of different animals. But there are some animals that are called negligibly senescent. A uh, famous photograph of a, uh, an ornithologist next to a pair of terns uh, 30 years ago and today, and he's aged tremendously, but the terns 
look just, just like the they did 30 years ago. It's amazing, isn't it? And I wondered if you could comment on any studies into negligible senescence There's and what those are. I could add to the turn story by talking about a certain kind of turtle called the Blanding's turtle. I think that's what it's called. And these guys, they have these 70-year-old turtles. They're marked, so they know how old they are. And you can't tell the difference between the 20-year-old one and the 70 year except that the 70-year-old one knows the best hiding places and has more progeny, has more progeny. So I don't know. That's a very, very interesting question. And it's very hard to study those old animals because there are so few of them and they're so precious. So you can't just take a bunch of them and, and you, you know. So it's, but it's a fascinating question. The whole question of why different species have different lifespans. There was a study that was done in um, Canada where they reviewed the literature on a lot of, from a lot of different labs. So that's a flaw in a sense already because these different studies were done under different conditions. So I don't know how much weight to give to this study. But what they found was that um, mammals that live longer as adults have lower levels of the IGF-1 hormone than animal species that have a shorter lifespan. There was a general trend. So obviously they have to have more to get larger. They would need more when they're growing. But once they reach adulthood, the study said that they actually had less. So maybe changes in this pathway have actually um, had an effect on evolution. And actually small dogs, which have very low levels of IGF-1, live a lot longer than large dogs. And, that, and they have mutations in the gene for IGF-1. So that doesn't say much about negligible senescence, but I think this whole question of what is it about that makes different species, I, I mean, we're finding not only our lab, but our lab and other labs, we found all these different pathways in these little worms that can control their lifespan, like maybe many, many different ways. I told you some of them. There's some I didn't get to tell you about. But anyway, presumably, some of those life mechanisms that can be changed within the worm species have been changed in evolution to account for some of these differences. So it's going to be really interesting to see. So one thing people look at is the level of oxidative damage. And in many, like in parrots, which can live to be 100, they have low levels of oxidative damage, which is nice. And a lot of other long-lived species do also. But then there's this little guy called a naked mole rat, which is a very small animal, but lives to be 40. It's very small. But it has almost no oxidative, oh no, it has lots of oxidative damage, and yet it lives long. So it's, it's going to be complicated. And you can't, it's hard to do experiments between species. With one species, you can change one gene and you know cause and effect. You change the gene, that's the cause, and whatever you see, that's the effect. But with a species difference, you just have to kind of compare and correlate. And that's a, a lot, scientifically, it's much more difficult. That's a fascinating question. Can I go back to C. elegans? Of course, okay. I love that, yes. <laughs> I just wondered, what, what would be the adaptive advantage of the hormones promoting aging in the C. elegans, or are we watching evolution in action? Well, I don't know. Um, but what, I mean, obviously, that, that's just, these are great questions. And that's one thing that's fun about working in this field, is you always think, why would it be this way? The problem is you don't know, but you can think of an, a possibility. And one possibility for these little worms is, if you think about their life strategy, a little worm is born, in three days it becomes an adult. And in the next three days it has its, makes its family, which is 300 progeny. So by the time it's six days old, the first progeny are adults. So they're young adults producing their progeny. There's 300. So now at day six, you have 301 worms. You have one older worm and 300 brand new worms. So what's the point? in making, uh, giving, producing all these mechanisms that can keep that one worm in great shape when you've already got 300 brand new worms, you know? So for the species, for the, you know, the success of producing more worms, you don't really need to make that one worm live so long. And so whereas with people, we have a much longer lifespan. We have a whole different strategy for life. We learn things, we teach each other, we form groups. And so, and it might even be advantageous for for the group to have older people because they can remember things and they can take care of the young ones. So for example, in this tsunami in Indonesia um, a couple years ago, they reported that people who had um, grandparents living with them, children with grandparents, were much more likely to survive because they remembered that when the ocean went out like that, that there was going to be a big wave. And they left and other people didn't. So you can see right there a selective advantage. All those little children are going to have their own children and they wouldn't have if they had died. So just because there was an older person. So you can imagine, depending on the strategy that a, a species has, um, you know, one, 
an older, uh, having a longer versus a shorter lifespan can have it. There are all sorts of theories. There's one theory that it might be advantageous for a population to, ha to age quickly so that it doesn't overpopulate. There was this one study, there are these guppies that live in these little pools in the Amazon. Um, you know, the water will trickle down, and there'll be a little pool here and a pool here, and there some have predators and some don't. And it turns out the ones that have predators, as you might imagine, the little guppies grow, so they're likely to be eaten. So they have shorter lifespans because they get eaten. But, and as expected, they grow really fast, and they start producing progeny really fast. But people would have thought if you took the predators away, they would kind of burn out. They would live fast, die young. You know, they'd have all these progeny, but then they would just stop. Well, no, they just kept reproducing, and they had longer lifespans than the ones without the the predators. So those guys, they grow a little more slowly, they have fewer progeny, and they're, uh, all right, so what's the reason? Well, nobody knows, but one possibility is that if they didn't do that, they might overpopulate the little pond and die, because they would run out of resources. So, and also you could imagine that um, having, in a, let's imagine a mammalian species, for example, like deer or something like that. You might imagine the little guys are, the little fawns are very, um, susceptible to a predator, but so would an old one be. So if you have some older individuals, then maybe a lion could eat the older one, and the little one would be saved. So who knows? But these are all ideas. It, that's what's fun. It's rich, full of ideas. And there, I suspect there's not just one answer. I suspect there are lots of different answers. You know? And I Should also stop. expect that there are lots more questions, but we have to bring this part of the program to a close. And let's thank Dr. Kenyon again. Thank you.